back with a new episode. Oh, I'm trying to kill the battery in this motherfucker. All right, so everybody knows who this is. No need for me to introduce myself unless you're just personally tuning in to me for the first time ever. If that's the case, my name's. Here's the motherfucking lock. I've got two choices, y'all. Pull over the car or bounce on the devil, put the pedal to the floor. Shit. Jay Z, my man. Um, yeah, I like rap. What are you gonna do? I actually did exactly what that song's talking about. I ran from cops more than once. Got away from them more than once. But in the end, they got me. So, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah. Okay. Let's shut this shit off. Um, so, yeah, my name is Corey LeVon, I'm the Ceremonial Witch, if you just tuned in, you should really go check out my older shit, so you're gonna be lost, because today I'm gonna be talking about how you're fucking God, how we're all God, I'm gonna be talking about awakening, how you know if you're awakened, not in the typical way, 10 signs that you're going through an awakening and all that kind of shit, I'm not doing that shit. I don't think I'll ever do that shit, but I'm going to be doing that shit in my ADD kind of way of explaining it. Um, let me just start it off with a bang here. One of the ways you know you're God, sorry, one of the ways you know you're going through awakening is if you're starting to wrestle with the idea that there isn't a God, that there isn't a devil, that somehow that you can't comprehend but in some way, shape, or form, we are all either gods, goddesses, or we all make up the god, or one of these popular ideas that are be shot around spiritual communities. Is that a fucking bee? I don't like bees, yo. <laughs> um, one of those popular ideas that are being shot around these communities, like the gods, goddesses, whatever the case is. For me right now, it's, and I say right now because I'm not fixed on my belief systems. My beliefs can change. Um, and I think it's important to be able to have some wiggle room. My beliefs are always along the same lines, but they're always being able to adapt so that I'm not closed minded. Let's say. Um, I'm going to use my man Alan Watts today to help me out with this. He was. Um, a very good philosopher, very down to earth, very grounded man who really understood a lot and really had a good way to articulate. I'd say he's borderline a fucking comedian because he liked to point out the ironic things about um, philosophy, spiritual awakenings, life in general. But one of the main things when you're awakening and beginning this process, whichever it is, whether you become a witch, a magician, you're just someone who's a new age, trying to fucking do law of attraction, you're someone trying to follow the shaman path, maybe watching the shamanator there, my friend, my man T-Wiz, maybe you're an EA wedding kind of guy, maybe you're a birch kind of witch, maybe you're a fucking ceremonial magician like freighter, maybe you're just somebody, you know, like the new age good guys that are like, like Greg Braden, Bruce Lipton, um, all those dudes, you know, maybe you just like uh, the um, higher self channel and you watch shit like that. Whatever the case is, one of the main ways you know you're starting to go through something is if you're tackling that idea. Now, people tackle that idea all the time and maybe not go through a spiritual awakening. But if you're continuously thinking about that, pondering on that, finding ways to know, you know, because whatever whatever the case may be, whether you were a Christian, a Jew, a Muslim, anything, any organized religion, really, whatever one you were, if you're starting to pull away from that because you're starting to realize that that's one of those ideas that aren't going away. It's not a fad in your thought process. You know what I mean? Like fads are things, trends are something that stays trendy for a while, you know, and that you can bring up and people, oh yeah, that's cool fads or something that came and gone so fast people are like well but that was so you know two years ago ten years ago five decades ago but that's one of the main ideas and what comes along with that is death and reincarnation the idea
idea of us dying, of what happens when we die. Starting to tinkle, tinker with that, those kind of ideas, with those beliefs, like what happens when we die. Because I gotta tell you, for me, one of the main reasons people like to believe in God is because they like to believe in heaven. They like to believe that there's no emptiness. Some people don't like the idea of reincarnating. Everything they've done on this earth is just done over with and they just restart. A lot of people don't like that. So it's better for them to believe in a God so that heaven is real. So that they think they did good work on this earth and they deserve heaven. But I hate to tell you, but how many video games do you play that uh, that when you die, you go through an underworld and or go through a heaven? Not so much. See, we have these stories and we have these myths that have archetypal people in it. Archetypal stories. Oh, fucking mosquito. They have archetypal stories. Archetypal myths. They have archetypal stories, but they're archetypal figures in it. The underworld and all that. And people have taken these stories literally. But I want to point something out to you is that, you know, we invent things, we make stories about things. So yes, we'll have a movie, we'll have books that play the underground, you know, shows the underworld and shit like that. For sure. But one of the things when you start truly becoming awakened, and maybe this is like a next step something, I don't know. Who knows how far it goes up when this thing starts to change. But one of the things that I slowly went from, from heaven and hell and other dimensions and whatever the case may be to just realizing that a lot of those mythos and stories with the archetypal um, characters in it they're explaining our earth process not what happens after death you know when a character is on his journey goes down to the underworld and comes back out that's his journey that's not you dying and then finishing off your journey in heaven because why would you go back to Earth, right? And, you know, people invent video games. What happens in a video game when you die? Well, you respawn. What happens when we die? We respawn. We come back to life. We have no idea. You know, it's good and bad shit. One of the reasons a lot of people don't like the idea of God being bad is because they don't like the idea of God being able to do these evil things. But we are all God. God has given us his power. He has extended into all of us to live out these, our lives, for him to have fun, for him to not be bored, for him to explore this earth that he created, you know? What's the point of creating all these things if you can't even step on it? You know what I mean? It's like if you make an ant farm or you make this maze for the rats, you know, the rats gotta go play in it and all that. Well, what do you do? You put a camera on the rat, you try to trick the rat, you get them to do these little things. Well. If you had the ability to, would you get smaller and go in there and do that? Well, God made him spell smaller. And he's doing this rat race with us, through us. So people don't like the idea that we can do bad. And that we're... That was weird. <laughs> that thing just turned out on its own. God doesn't like the idea... Or people don't like the idea that God can be bad. But they don't understand that we are extensions of God. We are all there is there's no heaven there's no hell there's no devil there's these things are all just created fucking things these are so everything i'm saying right now is the ideas that you start pondering when you become an awakening when you when you start your awakening process when you start becoming dare i say it enlightened let's say and i'm going through this because it's a good introduction for what, about what you're about to hear but people don't like the idea because the devil was a, a created construct. There is no devil. The devil is created for a being, for someone to blame. Bad shit people and authority have. You know what I mean? Which is funny, because, you know, the Catholic Church has killed a lot of people. Maybe not as much as Adolf Hitler, but the numbers are up there. And uh, they don't blame that shit on the devil. Well, they do, but in a different way. They say that the devil is making these witches do things. So by killing the witches, they're killing the devil, you know? It's like, well, isn't killing people a devil's game? And doesn't Jesus tell you to love your enemies? So that's kind of fucked up. Anyways. Um, but what I'm trying to get with this is 
the idea of the devil was created. There is God, but it's not how we can't comprehend the idea of God. So we make up all these archetypes, all these different types of God, all these different versions of God, and they all have relevance. But getting back to the hell and the heaven thing, those archetypal lands, let's say are not actual places after this. All the stories we created were for us on Earth. They're all expressions of our journey for on Earth. Because no one has made it to heaven and back to talk about it yet. No one's made it to hell and back to talk about it yet. That's why in our video games, if you do, I don't, I don't know. I haven't played video games in a while. But I've never played a video game unless the whole thing was staged in hell. You know, like a Diablo or something, which is not even the case. I mean, that was really staged in hell. I don't even know where that was staged, to be honest. I played Diablo when it was just for PlayStation 1 way back when. I don't even know. I remember what the fuck it was about. But point is, unless it's something like that, I mean, you don't descend into the underworld and then make your way to Earth and go make your way to heaven. You know what I mean? And no one's explaining those stories because no one's been through it yet. And nor will we be. Well, what's the one thing we do do is we respond. We get so many tries, you keep coming back. What's the, what's the video game about? You keep trying until you succeed. What's life about? You keep trying until you succeed. You know, it, it's, it's, it's not by mistake that these things happen the way they do. You know? But anyways, these are just two of the things that I'm going to... These are the very most basic easy ways. It's one of the things everybody likes to talk about. When people start talking about how do you know you're awakening, they like to bring up things that make people feel good. The feel good ideas. Like, oof. You, things get wonky around lights. You're having weird dreams. Maybe sleep paralysis. Maybe you had an addiction to drugs. And that gets, you know, that got me hooked. Ooh, I'm accepted. Normally my addiction to drugs makes me an outcast. But this is something accepting me, you know. They play on these emotions that make people feel good. Uh, you know, as as much as some of them may be true, it's not always nice to do shit like that. I'm just trying to be real. Whenever you start going through this, you're going to start questioning the, the true nature of God. You're going to try, try, question the true nature of the devil if such a being exists, which I'm to tell you it doesn't. Because, um, anyways, I'll get into that after. But... For now, this will be my introduction. I'm going to play some Alan Watts right now. And then after this little clip, um, I'm going to come in and chime on what he said, bring it back to what I'm trying to talk about. And as he progresses in this lecture, I'll keep breaking them off probably with the 10-minute mark, and I'll talk for about 5-10 minutes myself. And we're going to proceed like that for now. And I already have some stuff recorded, stuff I added on my podcast that wasn't on my video. Um which relates to this but we'll see if i put that in there or not it depends how long i fucking blabber on for but anyways so yeah my man alan watts respect much much respect to alan watts ask yourself this for what reason would a person be considered hopelessly insane what uh, sort of claims must a person simply not make well, there is one, and that is if anybody claims that he is God. That simply isn't done, certainly not in our culture, although it's very frequent in India. <coughs> but in our culture, that is simply uh, not allowed because we, uh, most of us from a Christian background, and if not that, from a Jewish background, and there's a great deal in common. Because both Christians and Jews are deeply concerned about somebody called Jesus Christ. Both Christians and Jews are in a way followers of Jesus Christ in different ways. He is a problem to both. <laughs> because he was the man who came out and discovered he was God. And uh, that simply is impermissible. The Jews handled it in one way. The Christians handled it quite as effectively in another way. The Christians handled Jesus perfectly, even more tactfully than the Jews, by putting him on a pedestal and saying, this was the only man who ever was God and nobody else 
was really so before and certainly nobody can be so afterwards. Stop right there. Put him on the altar, bow down to him, worship him, so that everything he had to say will be null and void. <laughs> See, that's what I'm talking about. Fucking Alan Watts says the things that people kind of want to think. That's one of the, the ideas I like. I think that's true. And I know people like Thunder Wizard and whoever else might say that's coming from a need to protect Jesus and wanting to protect his name and, you know, Jesus loves you and programming and all that. But it's not really the case. Because I know there's a lot of dumb shit Jesus said. I know Jesus is a myth mythical character. I know he's not fucking real. So why the fuck would I want to protect a mythical character? I don't. I want people... I don't care if his name is Jesus, Jesus, uh... Corey, fucking Jason, fucking Zeus, Peter, doesn't matter, Paul, Matthew, Mark, whoever the fuck. It could be Mary, it could be Mary Magdalene, it doesn't matter. But that story matters. And that story has been played out a few times, it's been changed, it's been altered, it's been done in different names, different times, different cultures. But that story lasts. It's an archetypal story. And that's the important part that people need to understand. You could say, fuck Jesus, he never existed, fuck this, fuck that. But the story's still going to have some bringing truth to you. I mean, there's a reason I want to watch that shit every Easter, even though I don't fucking believe in that shit. Like, it's fucked. But what my man Alan Watts is saying here is, well, first of all, the Jews, okay, whether he's talking about Judaism at the time, like I talked about in the story, the high, high priest, the Jews, they dealt with Jesus by sending him to Pontius Pilate and having him killed. He either means that, or, more specifically, that Judaism doesn't accept Jesus as the Son of God. But they said he's a prophet. So even though Jesus says he's the Son of God, they say, no, Jesus wasn't the Son of God. He was just confused. The Son of God hasn't come yet. He only comes once. And that's at the end of the world. That's what's in the Jewish doctrine. Okay, that's how it works. He only comes once. But Jesus was a prophet. He just didn't know the line between prophet and actual god. But he thought he was a god. And it turns out he was just a prophet. So that's how the Jews do it. Which just gives him some validity. But you can't trust a crazy person that much. Um, and the Christians dealt with it by, okay, he was the son of God. We need to worship him. But now the next time the son of God comes is at the end of the world. So no one else can be the son of God. But what did Jesus tell us? Well, he said he was the son of God, but we were all sons of God. And we can all enter the kingdom of heaven, and we can all do what he does. That was one of his messages. What did I just say when I started this fucking thing? That we're all part of God. What does Jesus say? Well, if we're all the son of the God, well, your father. If, you, if you're a son or a daughter, and you're a part of your father, your father's part of you, you have the same blood, the same family line. So for all the sons of God, that means we're all part of God. Therefore, I'm saying the same fucking thing Jesus is saying. You know, and I'm not trying to do it in a Christian way, I'm not trying to promote that religion or nothing, I'm just simply saying that we are all part of God. And we're both ca we're capable of both bad and good. You don't get to be, you, know, you don't get to only be part of God if you're good. Those assholes you don't like, those drug addicts, those murderers, those thieves, those Nazis that killed people in the past, they were all parts of God. And that's something you need to get in your head. And when you start wrestling with that idea, that's another idea that means you're starting to wake up. And you're starting to realize that there's more going on here. Another idea that helps you um, wake up is when you realize that if you start playing how do you put that? The whole Hindu idea that we're all playing a part and our parts are necessary. That we're all God playing a role and all our roles are necessary. Like the, the murderer's role is the same as the healer's role or the nurse and the doctor who heals people with a gunshot wound. You know, it's all this big drama. And this is where that whole idea of respawning comes in. It's like, yeah, these things are pretty evil and heinous. But the thing is, you don't actually feel it because once you die, you just come back and you're no, none the wiser. Now, 
just because this might be a game or a show or whatever, an alternate reality or, you know, a computer program, whatever they're saying in fucking uh, physics now, doesn't mean that when you have these emotions and hurt feelings, it doesn't feel real. This shit is real. I'm not saying any of this is fake. I'm saying this shit is real. But it's not what we've been led on to believe. Anyways, let's keep going with my man Alan Watts here. And I want to expand on some bigger ideas. I don't want to get stuck on something like that. And it worked beautifully. <laughs> but you see, the trouble about deep secrets is they can't be repressed indefinitely. Now, here's the problem, you see, that there are certain processes, some of which are what you might call spiritual exercises, others are simply chemicals, others are just horse sense, whereby one comes to see, very clearly indeed, that black goes with white and self goes with other. And as this becomes clear to you, it's rather shaking. Because, look, if what you define as you is inseparable from everything which you define as not you, just as front is inseparable from back. All right, it's a new day, but I'm going to keep going. So before I, you guys forget what the fuck you just said, I'll just keep going. Um, front and back, black and white. So this is straight up, like he said, whether you take chemicals, which would be like your, I don't know, whatever, your fucking hallucinogenics, your psychedelics, whatever, psilocybin to DMT to, you know, the acid, peyotes, those fucking shits, or you just have this intuitive knowledge, maybe somebody was born with something, or you are actively doing spiritual exercises and the goal of these exercises, whether or not these exercises are really uh, going to get you there or not, as long as you believe they will, then you will get that, which is kind of all you really need to unlock that, to be honest. You don't need a fucking guru, pay somebody. But anyways, we'll get to that later. But, but anyways, when you come into the knowing of black needs white, good needs bad, when you come into the knowing that these people bad people in society, the criminals define the fucking the upscale, the, the good people, you know, the Illuminati's uh, need, uh, the Illuminati members need the conspiracy members, the conspiracy members need the Illuminati members, God needs the devil, and the devil needs God, when you come to that realization, that's a good awakening step, but I think that's more than just awakening, because, you know, you can start your awakening and start realizing some of these other things, but still be very polarized. Know what I mean? Which I think eventually you get to. So I think this is part of depolarization, which I think is part of a balanced, a balanced form of awakening. Like if you're balanced and you're in the process of awakening, then yeah, you will, you will get these, you'll get that knowledge, 100%. But if you're not doing a balanced form of awakening. And that's, that's just to say that, you know, you're going at your own pace. It's not your fucking fault. You're looking at things as you look at them. And maybe you're still kind of just looking at things that you want to see. So you're finding out truth about certain things, but you're only going in one direction instead of like, okay, I'm going to go to the left, I'm going to go to the right, I'm going to go to God, I'm going to go to the devil, I'm going to go all over the fucking map to figure out what the fuck is real. But maybe you're just doing it in one direction. And one direction can give you a lot of knowledge. You can get a lot of fucking, you can find all the secrets in that direction. But then there's the opposite direction. And then there's the, the other directions, you know? So, all that's to say is that I think this part, this one, what he's coming into right there, what he's talking about right there, is depolarization. You start becoming, when you're able to look at your own belief system, and shed the ones you don't need. When you're able to challenge your own belief system, when you're able to challenge your own theories, when you're able to, you know, just fucking say, okay, well, this is what I think, but well, let's go see if I can prove it wrong. You know what I mean? See if I can tear it apart. When you 
you can start doing stuff like that when you're actively putting your feet on the ground and trying to be comfortably polarized, trying to be less uh, less affected or less, I don't know, attached to things, which is part of this. But anyways, I'm kind of jumbling my words. It's still fucking early, man. I've had one coffee. I've got nothing on me to make coffee or to work out or anything like that. So... I'm gonna have to suck it up and go all day without any more coffee, or suck it up and go pay for one at Tim's or go to like a fucking energy drink and shit like that. So we'll see how the fucking cookie crumbles today. Well, let's get back to Alan so I can get on something a little bit better. It's about depolarization and all the ideas that surround depolarization are very important when it comes to the awakening process. Now, when you start awakening, you're not going to be depolarized. It's something you actively have to do on your own. But most of the steps I'm talking about are things that you're going to come into knowing if you start down this path, you set the intention, you want to become awakened, blah, 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 blah. And this is what's going to happen. Whereas depolarization is a little different. I think you have to actively go for it. I think there's some people that get led to it, and it just kind of happens through synchronicity, but I think the majority is something you have to actively do. That's just my opinion, though. I could be absolutely positively wrong about that. Then you realize that deep down between self and other, there is some sort of conspiracy. <laughs> if these things always occur in combination, and look very different from each other and feel quite different. Nevertheless, the feeling of difference between them allows each one to exist. And so underneath the opposition or the polarity between self and other or between any other pair of opposites you can think of, there is something in common as there is, for example, between figure and background. You can't see a figure without a background. You can't have an organism without an environment. Equally, you can't have a background without a figure or an environment without organisms in it or without things in it. You can't have space, which is unoccupied by any solid. You can ha cannot have solids not occupying some space. This is absolutely elementary, and yet we don't realize it because, for example, the average person thinks that space is nothing. That it's just a sort of not thereness in which there are things. And we are slightly afraid that not thereness, that nothingness, that darkness, that the negative poles of all these oppositions will win. That they will eventually swallow up every kind of being and every kind of thereness. But when you catch on to the game, you realize that that won't happen. Because what is called not existing is quite incapable of uh, being there without the contrast of something called existing. It's like the crest and the trough of a wave. You can't have a wave that is all trough and no crest, just as you can't have a wave which is all crest and no trough. Such a thing has never been manifested in the physical universe. They go together. And that is the secret. There really is no other secret than that. But it is thoroughly repressed. And therefore, we are all educated to feel that we've got to fight for the white because the black might win. We've got to survive. You must survive. That's the great thing we're all working under and pounding it out day after day in anxiety. Because this is a description of anxiety. Anxiety is the fear that one of a pair of opposites might cancel the other forever. All right, so this part isn't necessarily a, an awakening in physical reality, or you know, something that, comes in, that you come into knowledge about. I just really need to point out how cool it was how he said that. So we're all programmed. So that's the way you get inside, though. When you realize everybody gets programmed. And not even necessarily on purpose. Like, at first you're going to think it's on purpose. 
first you're gonna think people did it to you, and you're gonna have to let that go. You're gonna have to let that go and take responsibility. That's a sign of awakening. Now, so is you. So is the first part, though. Like it comes in in, in order like that. So you become awakened. You start your awakening, sorry, by by realizing that okay, we're programmed. And at first you think people are doing it on purpose, hypnotizing us, whatever. Consumerism, for whatever the case is, and there certainly is some truth to that. 100. Now they may not be doing it necessarily on purpose, or they may. We don't know that yet. The jury's out on that. Because if they are doing it on purpose, they're hiding it very well. I mean, it's way out for everybody to see because we have all the knowledge and information that tells us how the process has happened. They're not changing it, so we have that as evidence. But nonetheless, um. But at first it's going to be like, okay, they're doing it to us, this is what the fuck's happening. And then from there, something is going to shift within you and it's going to realize like, okay, maybe, maybe they are hypnotizing me. Maybe I have a fucking choice whether to watch that fucking box they call a TV. Maybe I have a choice whether to buy the shit in the store. It's like this whole vaccine business. Okay, everybody wants the vaccine, everybody doesn't want the vaccine. Who the fuck knows who the fuck cares? I'm not here to lend an opinion on either side. The point is, they, everybody's saying, okay, they're forcing us to take the vaccine, which they're not. They're not going to force you to take the vaccine. What they are going to do is stop you from being able to do anything for fun unless you take the vaccine. So, all these fun services, ticket masks, are going somewhere overseas, maybe even your job if you work inside an office, if you want to go back to work, you need your vaccine, which isn't necessarily fun, but the money you make, you can pay your bills and have fun with. And if the government says, okay, well, everybody can go back to work, you just need the vaccine. Well, I don't want the vaccine. Well, then you'll have to go on welfare because we're no longer paying you. That kind of thing might happen, okay? So it's not necessarily forcing you, but in a manner of speaking, it kind of is. I, I get the point, right? But you have the choice to say, fuck you, Go on welfare, or I'm not gonna fucking take this vaccine. It's against my beliefs, it's against everything I fucking stand for. Blah 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 blah. Which you might want to look into that though, just so you know. Because from what I know, and from what I looked into, there's a lot of good things in a few of these vaccines that could really help you with a lot of different diseases, potentially make you live longer, last longer, not micro trips and shit like that. But I don't know. I'm still doing research on it because I don't even know why I want to take it. I'm not going to not take it and I'm not going to take it. I'm going to do research until I am either convinced one way or another. That's uh, the smartest thing I can do, I think. But anyways, I'm not going to take anybody's word for anything. I mean, I've already talked to three nurses when I went to places. I was at Costco last weekend. I signed up for it just so, you know, but it turns out. But I signed up for it so that when I get there, I can ask some questions. And then I just might fail to cancel. But I, 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 I picked our brain. But what do you know about this? How does it work? Can anybody fucking fuck weird things after? Blah, 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 blah. Are they telling you to say this? No shit like that. She thought that was a weird one. But anyways. But um, I don't even know where I was going with all of that. I took the vaccine as an example and I got lost in it. Oh, okay, yeah. So the programming thing think they're programming us just like people think they're forcing us to take the vaccine but it's a choice once you realize this okay this is where the personal responsibility part comes in which is a sign of awakening but it's like a second or third sign it's like uh it's down the road so first you have to before you can realize that it's your responsibility and you have the power to change reality you first have to realize okay we make a reality but that knowledge has been suppressed from us which is true and from there, it's like, okay, well, are they doing it on purpose or is it an accident? Well, probably both. Okay, well, do I stay a victim and blame them? Or now that I know I can make my own reality, do I stop listening and doing all the things that program me and take control of my fucking life and stop blaming them? Because, yeah, okay, maybe up until now, I can blame it on them. Well, that's really not going to suit me serve me anyways, but I could. I could get away with it, and it would be justified, sure. But it's really not going to serve you. But whatever, let's say you, you go with that. Then say, like, okay, but at this point on now, I know how the process works. I know how to program my own fucking mind. I know how to do magic. I know how to get symbols in my fucking mind. I know how they're doing it to me. 
So you're gonna sit in front of that fucking TV and keep watching this shit? Well, whose fucking fault is that? You're gonna blame Illuminati for fucking owning all the TV channels and you can't even watch a single TV show without being programmed by the Illuminati, yet every one of those shows have always been programmed by the Illuminati. It's not like they never didn't own it, you know what I mean? I mean, that, that just, just, I don't believe in Illuminati. I'm just saying, that line of thinking is just flawed from the get-go. And when I say I don't believe in Illuminati, it's the way people talk about it. I like people thinking the Illuminati are this fucking group of fucking badass magicians that are fucking with the world and bringing it down and dark, demonic forces. I don't care if people think that. I take that energy. I use it to fuel my fucking magic, and I, and I associate as one of those members, and I fucking suck as much energy out of that fucking thought form of Illuminati that I can, but, you know, energy is just energy, learn how to transform it, it don't fucking matter, it's all gravy, baby, and I love me some gravy, gravy on everything if I could, I put it on my wife's pussy and eat it, oh, shit, feeling good, boys and girls, my little witches, witchlets, and, and, and magicians, and, and magical practitioners, and wonderful new age bastards, and all you fucking lovely people that decided to tune in today, thank you. But anyways, so the whole programming thing, and it happens in steps. You have to first think your programs and blame people, and then you have to let that shit go, but come to your own realization. So if you're still in the first step, don't think I'm dissing you, because I'm not. I was there, baby. I have proof in episodes about me talking about the Catholic Church, different Illuminati's, different groups, saying that they're doing it to us. And now, here I am, a couple years later, saying the exact opposite. I'm a walking fucking contradiction if you look at my playlist. If you look at all my videos, but it's because you come into this knowledge. And there's a process to it. And as much as I don't like the clear-cut fucking 10 signs of awakening, I mean, I listen to all those types of videos. I know what some of them are. I know some of them have some libidity to them, so. Anyways, my eyes are fucking heavy as shit, man. Wow. I hate that. You wake up in the morning thinking you just had a good night's sleep, yet your eyes are closing on the fucking highway already, but it's brutal. Anyways. But that's what he's talking about. Black needs white, front needs back. Male needs female. Two females, they need each other. If that's what they like, two males, if that's what they like. Whatever other genders, blah, 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 blah. But our opposites attract shit is a real fucking shit. And it's 10 kilometers. Shit. Take exit 96 onto County Road 41 toward Marionville. But I truly think it comes to depolarization. Is all I'm trying to say. No, I think I already said that, so I don't even know what I'm trying to say now. But I'm trying to say something. Who the fuck knows what it is? But the whole black and white thing, I like how you put that. Anyways, let's go back. Let's see what he says. And if by any chance, by any means, you find out that that is not so, you have an entirely new attitude to what human beings are doing. Which may be very creative but which also may be very dangerous. You see through the game. The game called white must win. Because you know that neither black nor white are going to win. Because they belong to each other. I, I, I know it's just fast, but it's because I forgot the main point. That was polarization, which has nothing to do with it. But it was the black and white thing. The reason I got on the program is because he says in their speaking that we were taught since we were a kid that we have to fight for the white. And the black has to go down. But the truth of the matter is that they're both fucking needed. We need both black and white to survive. We need both black and white for our fucking world to keep turning. I mean, one's inseparable without the other. You can't have one without the other. So, anyways, uh, the reason I got to programming was because, you know, I said that wasn't a true symptom or a way you know you're becoming a, a awakening or enlightenment, whatever you want to 
to call it. But then I broke it down and said, well, no, because I guess it's talking about programming and programming and blah, 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 blah. Anyway, let's get back to it, okay? I don't like really cutting them off. All this will go for a while unless it's something I really need to say. So one of the problems of the various chemicals which can uh, change the human mind in certain ways so that it becomes apparent that inside and outside go together is that they do rather give the show away and people who take these chemicals and see through the human game cannot be trusted. They may decide to be good sports and go back into the game and play it as if it were for real or they may not and if they don't what's going to happen? Now, you see, what is, uh, let me speak specifically for a moment, I said the subject of this is LSD. LSD is one such chemical that does produce this curious effect of making you aware of the polarity of things. It does lots of other things. It does lots of rather unessential and trivial things. And these, of course, in all the publicity in the various national magazines about LSD get thoroughly emphasized. In other words, when somebody says something's real psychedelic, they mean bizarre. And when the national magazines try to illustrate the effect of these chemicals with various photographs, they come on with blurred photographs of all sorts of things higgledy-piggledy messed together. Uh, naked girls seen through prisms. <laughs> well, that's absolutely nothing to do with it. If uh, you wanted some sort of appropriate illustration for a Life magazine article on the effects of LSD, uh, you would have one very simple solution. You would publish the most gorgeous color reproductions of Persian miniatures and of uh, Moorish arabesques and of the illuminations of Celtic manuscripts. That would give you the story so far as changes in human sensation are concerned. But there would be one thing very difficult to put across in pictures because the people who looked at them, if they didn't get the point of view, wouldn't see it. And that is what I will call the sensation as well as the intellectual understanding of polarity. That is to say that the inside and the outside the subjective and the objective, the self and the other, go together. In other words, uh, what, uh, there is a harmony, an unbreakable harmony. I'm, when I'm using the word harmony, I don't necessarily mean something sweet. I mean absolute uh, concordant relationship between what goes on inside your skin and what goes on outside your skin. It isn't that what goes on outside is so powerful that it pushes around and controls what goes on inside. Equally so, it isn't that what goes on inside is so strong that it often succeeds in pushing around what goes on outside. It is very simply that the two uh, processes, the two behaviors, are one. What you do is what the universe does. And what the universe does is also what you do. Not you in the sense of your superficial ego, which is a very small, little tiny area of your conscious sensitivity, but you in the sense of your total psychophysical organism, conscious as well as unconscious. This is not something that arrived in the world from somewhere else altogether that confronts an alien reality. What you are is the universe, in, a, in fact, the works, what there is and always has been and always will be forever and ever, performing an act called a John Doe. And this is such a subversion of common sense, but is, in fact, matter of fact, something, if you stop to think about it, that is completely obvious. Only everything conspires to prevent you from seeing that obvious thing. 
Because when you were babies, practically, all your parents and your teachers and your aunts and uncles and your older brothers and sisters got together and they told you who you were. They defined you as Johnny, who is just Johnny. And, 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 and don't you come on too strong, Johnny, because, um, <laughs> no, you've got elders and betters around here. But you're responsible. You're a free agent. You'd better be. <laughs> and so when you are told from childhood that you are expected and commanded to behave in a way that will be acceptable only if you do it voluntarily, you remain permanently mixed up. <laughs> that, if anything, is permanent brain damage. <laughs> So, but that's the idea, you see, because that's the game we're playing. You started it. I didn't. <laughs> see? That's the game we're playing. And we can make all kinds of complexities out of that. And really, in a way, have enormous fun. But once anybody sees through that, well, we're frightened. Once you get this sense of polarity, of your inside being the same process as your outside and your ego being one and the same process as the whole universe going on then we are afraid that people may say well good equals bad and we can do anything we like and we didn't in any way be further subject to the ordinary rules of human conduct and uh, we can wear what all oh, right this might be a little loud here my window open but that's an important part, realizing that whenever we realize this kind of stuff, that, you know, we can say, well, good equals bad, and bad equals good, and, you know, it really matters. There's a type of nihilisticness that comes along with this. It can buck you up. You can take hold of you, and you can lose yourself in it. It can really do a fucking, a bunch of damage. That's what he's talking about here. But it's a sign of being coming awakening. Like, I mean, it really is. Because when you realize this stuff, it can have that effect. And a lot of people are going to get that. I think everybody will get, is going to get that at some point. I think it's just different degrees. I think sometimes some people get it worse than others. So like for me, for example, I get nihilistic every so often. For me, it's like... I don't know, once every four months, let's say, three times a year, I get pretty nihilistic. For various times, anywhere from like a couple weeks, a couple days, to a couple months. Even though it's every four months, and that's what is brutal, like almost two months of it. Well, that means like I got one more month left until I get nihilistic again. You know, it's not a really big break in between. So, and that's normally in the winter months. But anyways. Um, so, so, if you are becoming nihilistic, well, there is some good news, and the, the good news is that, you know, you are becoming awakened. Bad news is, you're stuck in your nihilistic ways, and you don't see the point of life anymore, and, you know, because there's things you realize that have, that has, like, dumped them down, almost. You don't know what the fuck's the point, you know? But that's that's like the complete wrong way to look at things. You know, I think I think I recorded it, I think it'll be on later, but it says at some point that there's two types of people that are awakened. There's the one that realizes, you know, the secrets, comes awakened, and then it goes and hides and never comes back to society. You know, the monk or the guy who likes to hide in the bush or whatever the case is. Then there's the other one who comes awakened and comes back into society. But, you know, he's got something from his journey that you can recognize within him that he's been somewhere. And he's going to help everybody realize how to get there. And blah, 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 blah. I think that was really cool. That's one of the things that made me really want to make this episode. Because, you know, anyway, that's the point's pretty obvious. But, um, Jesus, I lost my train of thought. Give me a second, it's going. Um, okay, yeah, but that's the whole wrong way. The nihilistic way is the wrong way to look at it because if you are that person who comes back into society, well, with a little bit of practice and fine-tuning, 
you can change your whole life around and, and become greater. And knowing the things you know can only help this process even faster. So what I'm trying to say is, for me example, okay, I'm aware of a few things that, you know, most people won't come into in their entire lifetime. Because of these things that I know, I'm able to go to work every day, not feel like a slave. I can go to work, I can come home, I can drink, I can not drink, I can do drugs, I can not do drugs. I could spend a bunch of money or I could save a bunch of money. I could cast for a bunch of money and receive a bunch of money. I mean, I can break a car and get a new car. And nothing really matters. But in the same sense, it all matters and it's all part of the game and it's all fun. And I just shoot myself back into the role even though I know that it's just silly. You know what I mean? And that's part of the fun. Once you realize that we're all just playing a fucking game here, we're all just doing this and we're playing this game and, you know, we're just trying to get by and who knows why. Well, anyways, I'm going to have to re-listen to this because I think I lost my train of thought too far back. And I, <laughs> I'm not saying something right, it's fucking in my head. Anyways, let me, let me re-listen to this. Clothes we like or no clothes at all. We can have what sexual life we like. We can do anything. And uh, we are going to generally, because the world is being rather oppressive towards us, challenge the whole thing and run amok. And a lot of people are doing just exactly that. So I want to introduce into this whole problem some ancient wisdom. I have really two things to talk about. How cultures, which always did know in some way, or uh, among whom a large number of people always did know this secret, handled it. And then I want to make some observations about how we are trying to handle it. And All right. Lighting's not the greatest, but I'll try to work with it anyways. Oh, fuck. All right. So the idea in the car, the last thing I was trying to talk about, the last thing I was trying to say was, like I said, he said there's these two kinds of um, practitioners, two, people, two kinds of people that become awakened. One hides away keep secrets to themselves, the person comes out and shares with them. Um, I consider myself that second type of person who's found it, who's found some secret knowledge that's helped him, and now I'm trying to share it, put it forward. Yes, my face is dirty, finished work, I gotta go shower. Um, but the, the key to the nihilistic um, feelings that you have is the same key, is the same, yeah, same key to that unlock the door that got you to the nihilistic feelings. So, same ideas I'm making nihilistic, like, well, there's no God, but we're all part of the Godhead, but, you know, we're gonna die, and we're just gonna reincarnate, so what does it fucking matter, and, you know? But, knowing all this stuff, knowing that you've been, you've been programmed, same thing, right? When you know you're programmed, and things have happened to you, the reason your life sucks is because your parents had a shitty life, and you got programmed by them. And you could be like a fucking victim and just be all pissed off at that, you know. And everybody's got their hard times, man. I'm not trying to shit on anybody because life's tough. I get it. But this, that same problem that the reason why you have the shitty life because you've been programmed by your parents. Well, it's the same answer how to get out of that fucking hole. You know how the process works now. It's through repetition through symbolic fucking shit from what you see, but not consciously see the things that it goes into the subconscious while your conscious is busy. You use that same process to get things in your subconscious now to fix the problem. Well, it's the same key to the, to the nihilistic problem. The same reasons that made you nihilistic is the same way you can get out of being nihilistic. Because look, my summer wasn't great. And I'm not going to pretend I have more problems than anybody else because everybody's got their problems, especially in the times that we're in now. It's not like this is a really bad time or anything, but it's it's unnerving or it's it's unprecedented what's going on, you know what I mean? No one expected something like this to happen and everybody in our lifetime has never been through this type of plague or big mass disease kind of thing. You know, everybody knew about people getting cancer, but it wasn't like this. Now this is a virus that's easy that we can give to each other, quote unquote that um, can and may kill us, quote unquote. So 
I'm not trying to say that this is a hard time because I, I think we're living in one of the best times ever, to be honest. But but my summer wasn't easy. The summer that just happened. Previous to this one, I found out me and my wife almost got almost split up. I was very nihilistic at my last job. I was doing rotating shifts. I was having a hard fucking time, you know. I was like, okay, I'm having all the success with magic, but yet I can't get anything concrete. I still don't even know what the fuck my passion is. Like, what the fuck is wrong with me? Why can I make fucking little things fucking manifest, but I can't get my passion to be clear to me? I can't get these spirits I'm talking to to give me a straight answer on how to fucking know what my passion is, you know, shit like that. So I got, I became very nihilistic because of those things. And the way out of that was to just keep playing the part was to realize that, okay, well, there's something I'm missing. There's something I'm not doing right. I to take, I took full responsibility for how I was feeling. I didn't blame it on everybody else. I didn't blame it on anybody else. I knew it was something that I wasn't figuring out yet. So I just went harder into it with balance with my family life. And that was the key. It wasn't more magic. It wasn't more spiritual activities. It wasn't more doing more rituals and shit like that to try to fucking force out my passion. It was less doing less of that shit so that I can Oh, sorry, someone was texting me. Um, um, I wasn't more magical practices and more YouTube time and shit like that. It was less of that. It was to become more grounded in my realm, more grounded in my life, be a better father to my kids. Be a better father to my kids, be a better husband to my wife. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, better husband to my wife. I thought I said that wrong. I thought I said be a better wife to my husband. <laughs> but, and then when I started doing that, then all of a sudden I got this job. And this job is far from what I want to do for my passion, my purpose. It's not exactly what I want to do for the rest of my life, but I know I'm on the path now. So I might not know. I might not know my passion, my purpose yet. But what I do know is that I'm on the right track now. And I don't know how to explain it other than how my life has been unfolding for me. Has been... Um, I can tell I'm on the upswing, I'm on the upward spiral rather than the downward spiral. And for some reason, within that, you can feel the sensation within you. That means you need um, you need the, you, you feel, oh, sorry, someone's texting me at the same time and I keep looking at the messages, but the way everything's going in my life, is making, is showing me that everything is gonna be okay, and that I'm on the right path, I'm doing everything and okay, and then I, it, it helped that I had dreams where, you know, angels and family members have told me, just be patient, be patient, everything comes with time, you can't do everything too fast, blah, 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 blah. But the point is, everything that's been going on has been proof of my growth and my steps, and it's like, I still know the same things I know when I was nihilistic. I still know the things I just explained about, you know, we're just gonna reincarnate. I might not even know my family members in my next life, and you know, I'm gonna miss them, but they're not gonna miss me, and blah, 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 all that shit that makes you nihilistic. I still know all that, but it doesn't matter, because to be submerged completely in the present moment, okay, right now, and enjoying this life, the materialistic world that everybody is, wants to shit on and hate on. It's like, no, the point of this, the point of magic, the point of all these things that we teach is to make the materialistic world be good for you so you can have a good time, so you can enjoy, so you can thrive in this materialistic world. You can do 10% of your of your daily uh, routine is magic. And then the other 90% of your day is you enjoying the fruits of your labor. And so, on that, I'm just gonna, probably just gonna end the video, cause it's gonna go long if I just keep going. So, this is probably the last thing I talk about, but I just wanted to make sure I made that clear, that the point, I don't think I hit on his point very well, that he, that he brought up, but the point I was just, want, I wanted to make was, you know, one of the biggest signs is the nihilistic thing. Yeah, so, the overarching thing I was talking about was the nihil, the last thing was the nihilist, nihilism. That was a sign of, of going through an awakening, and it could be a very tough one, which will bring you into another sign of the awakening that, you know, all these sites do talk about, is the dark night of the soul. 
the your nihilistic phase can bring you into a dark night of the soul now not the same dark night of the soul as um, going through facing your fears and or doing shadow work although the shadow work too but i could bring on nihilistic shit too um they kind of all kind of end up getting linked at some point sometimes you start going through the shadow work and you just kind of get pissed off because things aren't working right and you can't advance and you feel like you're standing still so then that brings on the nihilistic feelings like what the fuck is the point fuck all this shit you know shit like that so but all these things are signs of you know you are going through the awakening process so if you are having these thoughts see i focus more on the thought processes as you can probably tell i'm a very in my head kind of guy i, I analyze everything i have a pretty high iq but i overanalyze everything and i overthink everything so when it comes to this shit it kind of works to my benefit because when i overthink about this shit i can figure it out reverse engineer shit you know tinker with shit and in theory come up with my own theories <laughs> and then put it into practice to see if they work so it kind of works out for me finally once in my life otherwise it, it, this has been more of a curse than a blessing you know and you know like everything else in time things are revealed to you why it's important to have this and you know i don't i don't regret ever having this at a certain point in my life that i thought like this sucks i wish i wasn't like this and i take that back because i'm like the way i am i enjoy who i am i know i'm weird i know i'm different but i accept all that and i love exactly who i am and that's another sign of that everything is just going well in your life you know when you can, when you can have that kind of love and acceptance for yourself that you know whatever you look like whatever you feel like whatever you you do you are you accept it i'm not perfect i'm not happy in my life and you know waiting for the bad things to happen not the case i'm still gonna keep incrementing uphill for where i want to go and what i want to be so i'm far from perfect but i am okay with how everything has transpired and how i am in my life you know and that's something that also comes with time but yeah so i'm not going to restate all the steps and all the different things that i talked about and there are more there are more states of mind and thought processes rather than like physical symptoms and that's why like i know i mean it's like you know 10 signs you're going through a spiritual awakening kind of, you know i kind of diss those things but they do have their merit because someone who's just getting into this needs to hear something like that more than that there are people that want to know about the physical symptoms rather than the spiritual or the mind processes and you know that's where people like me come in but anyways that's gonna be about it for today. I hope you enjoyed this whole fucking shebang. And yeah. Really you require a skill. And it's enormously important, especially for American people, to understand that there is absolutely no possibility of having any pleasure in life at all without skill. Money doesn't buy pleasure. Ever. Look, if you want to get stoned drunk, and go out and get a bottle of bourbon and down it. You can't do that except for people who have practiced the distiller's art. You can't even make love without art. Where I live in Sausalito, we have a harbor full of ever so many pleasure craft. Motor cruisers, sailing boats, all kinds of things. And they never leave the dock. <laughs> All that happens with them is their owners have cocktail parties there on Saturdays and Sundays. Because they discovered, having bought these things, that the discipline of sailing is difficult to learn and takes a lot of time. And they didn't have time for it, so they just bought the thing as a status symbol. So, in other words, um, you, you can't have pleasure in life without skill. But it isn't an unpleasant task to learn a skill. If the teacher, in the first place, gets you fascinated with it. There is immense pleasure in learning how to do anything skillfully. To make carpentry things, to cook, to write, to calculate, anything you want. It can be immensely pleasurable to learn uh, the discipline. And it is completely indispensable. Because, look, you may be a very inspired musician. I, I'm not a, a musical technologist, you see, and I regret it, but I'm a word, word technologist. But I can hear in my head 
all kinds of symphonies and all kinds of marvelous compositions, but I don't have the technique to write them down on paper and share them with somebody else. Too bad. Maybe next time around. <laughs> <laughs> but you see so far as words are concerned I can express ideas because I have studied language and I work very hard uh, not that I didn't like it I intensely enjoy the work of writing a book although it is difficult but it's fascinating to say what can never possibly be said <laughs> so uh, you see what's happening. What you have to do, you have inspiration, but then you have to have technique to incarnate, to express your inspiration. That is to say, to bring heaven down to earth and to express heaven in terms of earth. Of course, they are really one behind the scenes, but there's no way of pointing it out unless you do something skillful. You see, we are all, at the moment, absolutely in the midst of the beatific vision. We are all uh, one with the divine, or some... I don't like that sort of wishy-washy language. But we are all there. But we are so much there that we're like fish in water. They don't know they're in water. Like the birds don't know they're in the air because it's all around them. And in the same way, we don't know what the color of our eyes is. I don't mean whether you've got blue or brown eyes, but the color of the lens of your eye. You call that transparent. No color. See, because you can't see it. But it's basic to being able to see anything. So in order to find out where you are, there has to be some way of drawing attention to it. And that involves skill. Upaya in Sanskrit. Skillful means. So, it's all very well. Anybody can have ecstasy. Anybody, as a matter of fact, can become uh, aware that he is one with the eternal ground of the universe. But since that's what you are anyway, I'm going to ask, so what? When a hero goes on an adventure, and he leaves his people, and is going to a strange land, he can go away and just hide himself around the corner in an obscure house, and then appear a year later and say, I've been on a heroic journey and tell all sorts of tales. And they say, prove it. Because they expect him to bring back something. Something which nobody has seen before. Then they believe you've been on a journey. And so in the same way, exactly, anybody who goes on a spiritual journey must bring something back. Because if you just say, oh man, it was a gas. <laughs> Anyone can say that. <laughs> now this is why in the doctrines of Buddhism there is a differentiation between two kinds of enlightened beings. They are both forms of Buddha, which is to say the word Buddha means somebody who has awakened, who has discovered the secret behind all this. And in other words, all this thing we call life with its frantic concerns is a big act which you, in your unconscious depths, are deliberately setting up. So, you can do one of two things when you discover this. You can become what's called a Pratyeka Buddha. That means a private Buddha, who doesn't tell anything. Or you can become a Bodhisattva. A Pratyeka Buddha goes off into his ecstasy and never is seen again. Bodhisattva is come, one who comes back and appears in the everyday world and plays the game of the everyday world by the rules of the everyday world. But he brings with him upaya. He brings with him some way of showing that he's been on the journey, that he's come back, and he's going to let you in on the secret too. If you, if, 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 you'll play it cool and also come back to join in the everyday life of everyday people. Because this is the rule. If the world is dramatic, if the world, as the Hindus say, is a big act put on by the divine self, one of the rules of coming on stage is that you don't come on as yourself. You come on as the part that you're going to play. It's very bad form if an actor always acts the same way. That's what's called a star, as distinct from an actor. 
a real actor can become anything. And so, but in private life, well, he's just Mr. Jones. And, but he doesn't come on the stage that way. So in the same way, if you know that behind the scenes, in the depths, fundamentally, you are it. You don't come on that way. It always comes on as something else. That's the rule of the stage. Because without that, there wouldn't be a play. There would only be reality. No illusion. And the whole point of life is illusion. From the word Latin, ludere, to play. Showbiz. The show must go on, so don't give it away. But the truth has a way of leaking. It gets out. But then the important thing is, you see, when the truth gets out, those who catch hold of it must find a way of staying in contact with what society calls reality. That is to say, if you have a radio, you don't only need an antenna, you also need a ground. So what happens in the world of mysticism, of uh, psychedelic visions and so on, needs to be grounded. So then there are always two uh, directions in which such a discipline works. One, preparatory. In other words, those who taught disciplines for awakening in the Orient were always careful to screen, first of all to screen those who applied, and then after screening them, to uh, make them sensible. So that they knew how to handle the game and, of ordinary human existence and play it by the ordinary human rules. In other words, that they had strength of character and were not the sort of people who would be wiped out because they had no strength of character by an overwhelming experience. Then they let them in. But there are certain disciplines such as Zen where you get into the essential secret very early on in the discipline. And after that, they are concerned with much more training in showing you how to use it. How to use the power to use the vision which you have acquired. And so it is with the current, uh, what we will call LSD scene, that is uh, raging through the United States. Uh, it unfortunately lacks discipline. And I'm not trying to say this in a kind of severe, authoritarian, paternalistic way but only that it would be so much more fun if it had it. In other words, when people try to express what they have seen in this kind of changed state of consciousness, they show five movies going on at once, uh, projected upon torn bedsheets, with stroboscopic lights going as fast as possible at the same time, and 11 jazz bands playing. And uh, they're going to blow their minds, baby. <laughs> and every, everybody else who hasn't seen this thing, look around and say, well, it's a mess. I don't like the looks of it. Let's suppose that while you were very, very high on LSD, you looked into a filthy ashtray and you saw the beatific vision. Which is, of course, the case because... Uh, wherever you look, if you, I, your eyes are open, you will see the face of the divine. Then you come out of your ec ecstasy with the dirty ashtray and say to everybody, here it is. <laughs> no. There is a possibility. If you are an extraordinarily skillful painter, let's suppose that while you were very, very high, on LSD, you looked into a filthy ashtray and you saw the beatific vision. Which is, of course, the case because uh, wherever you look, if you, I, your eyes are open, you will see the face of the divine. 
Then you come out of your ecstasy with the dirty ashtray and say to everybody, here it is. <laughs> no. There is a possibility. If you are an extraordinarily skillful painter, or even photographer, of presenting the dirty ashtray so that everybody else will see almost what you saw in it. But you will have to have a technique which will translate every grain of ash into a jewel. Because that's what you actually saw. But that requires mastery of an art. And I'm afraid uh, people think that all it's necessary to do is uh, just throw out any old thing because under that transformed state of consciousness any old thing is the, is the works. But nobody else can see it if they haven't shared that point of view. So then, uh, this becomes for us in the United States an extremely important social problem. The cat is out of the bag. We are living in a scientific world where secrets cannot be kept. And anyone, anytime, can uh, pick up something which will short-circuit all the ancient religious techniques, yoga practice, meditation, etc., etc. This is all very embarrassing, but it will happen, not for everybody, but for a lot of people. And they will see what all those sages and Buddhas and uh, yogis and uh, prophets saw in ancient times. And it will be very clear. So what? So you see, you can say, look at all these people who haven't seen it. This is a temptation. Look at them all going about their business, earning money and uh, grinding it out at the bank or the insurance office or whatever it is every day and how serious they look all about it and they don't really know it's a game. And you can, uh, you can cultivate a certain contempt for people like that. But it's very, very bad to do that. Because, of course, don't forget they have a certain contempt for you. You see, always the nice people in town who live in the best residences, uh, they know that they're nice because there are some people on the other side of the tracks who are not nice. And so at their cocktail parties, they have a lot to say about the people who are not nice because that boosts their collective ego. There would be no other way of doing it. You don't know that you're a law-abiding citizen unless there are some people who aren't. And if it's important to you to congratulate yourself on being law-abiding, you therefore have to have some criminal classes outside the pale, of course, of your immediate associates. <laughs> On the other hand, the people who are not nice, they have their parties. And they boost their collective ego by saying that they're the people who are really in. Whereas these poor squares who deliver the mail faithfully and uh, who carry on what you call responsible jobs, they're just dupes. All, when they earn their money, all they do is they buy toy rocket ships with it and go roaring around and so on, and that's, they think that's pleasure. So the people who are not nice boost their collective ego in that way. Neither of them realizing that they need the other just as much as a flower needs a bee and a bee needs a flower. So you, when you see the people who you think are not in on the secret, you, if you really understand, you have to revise your opinion completely and say that the squares are the people who are really far out. Because they don't even know where they started. <laughs> see, a, a, an enlightened Hindu or, or Buddhist looks at the ignorant people of this world and says, my respects. Because here I see the divine essence, having altogether forgotten what it is, and playing the most far-out game of being completely lost. 
congratulations. How far up can you get? <laughs> so if you understand that, you, you don't start a war with people you might say are square. Don't challenge them. Don't bug them. Don't frighten them. The reason is not because they are immature, because they are babies and you mustn't scare babies. It's nothing to do with that. You mustn't frighten them because they are doing a very far out act. They are walking uh, on a tightrope, miles up. And they've got to do that balancing act and if you shout, they may lose their nerve. See, that's what the, we call the responsible people of the world are doing. It is an act, it's a game, just like the tightrope walker. But it's a risky one. And you can get ulcers from it. And uh, all sorts of troubles. But you must respect it. And say, congratulations on being so far out.